great to be here. This, it's especially great to be in uh, my hometown. I wasn't born in Prescott, uh, but I grew up in Prescott. I was actually born in Tucson. When my, any Tucsonians? Uh, my parents were going to the University of Arizona, and I was born down there, and then I broke their hearts and became a Sun Devil. Uh, my youngest son returned the favor and graduated from the University of Arizona a couple of years ago. So, all right, so we, uh, we have some very interesting basketball and football weekends at the Bennett home. And I love being in the presence of Republican women. And even though I'm in the presence of many, many wonderful Republican women here tonight, I'm also in the, pres in the presence of my favorite Republican woman, who is my mother. <laughs> Actually, my wife and my daughter are Republicans, and so they're the other two favorite uh, Republican women in my life. But uh, it's good to be here. Um, Prescott has been home to the Bennett's for a long time. Actually, it was the Bulichek's before that. Uh, Grandma and Grandpa's phone number was 49. Um, and so that kind of puts things in perspective on, on when they showed up here. Uh, prior to that, I had a great grandparent who uh, helped to found the Gilbert area uh, and moved to Gilbert in 1915. Uh, another great grandfather who was the first mayor of Glendale. So, we got some ties to Glendale. Anybody from Glendale? Yes. No? Yes, all right, good. Uh, and then the great great grandparents who had the mercantile store in Douglas uh, back around the uh, late 1800s. So, Arizona's been a great home to the Haymores and the Bulicheks and the Bennetts and uh, the Tennies. I married a Tenny. Uh, so it's good to be back home. Um, although we have had to rent our home up here since we're living in the valley. I was going to commute when I became the Secretary of State, kind of like I did in the Senate. When I was President of the Senate, I drove from Prescott to Phoenix and back every day for four years. Uh, we had three teenagers at home. And having dad at home, with teenagers I felt was important enough to drive back home every night. Uh, now they've all grown up. We have three grown children, all college graduates. Um, one married. Our oldest son is a high school teacher up in Utah. He and his wife have our two grandchildren, two grandsons. Our daughter is a labor and delivery nurse down in the Mesa Gilbert area with Banner Hospitals. And then our youngest son works for a Christian international food bank called Feed My Starving Children. So we're very blessed with three great kids. Now, I'm just going to talk about a, a couple of things that are on my mind. And as many of you asked when I walked in, yes, I do have the guitar. So we'll finish with the song. Um, I want to share a quote with you that I have now shared a couple of times. I shared it at the state Republican meeting uh, a couple of months ago or whatever that was. And uh, one other time since then, but um, this was spoken by a young, uh, not well, maybe not young, a new United States Senator from Illinois back in 2006. He said, the fact that we are here today, he's standing on the floor of the U.S. Senate, the fact that we are here today debating, right, raising America's debt limit is a sign of leadership failure. It's a sign that the U.S. government cannot pay its own bills. It's a sign that we now depend on ongoing financial assistance from foreign countries to finance our government's reckless fiscal policies. Increasing America's debt weakens us domestically and internationally. Leadership means that the buck stops here. Instead, Washington is shifting the burden of bad choices today onto the backs of our children and grandchildren. America has a debt problem and a failure of leadership. Americans deserve better. Well, of course, that was spoken by Barack Obama, who was then U.S. Senator from Illinois. And um, yes, not everything went well, or as good as we would have hoped uh, financially, as far as the leadership of our country, even before him. But did you know that it took from George Washington to Jimmy Carter before we had $1 trillion of national debt? Almost 200 years, about 38 presidents, we were a trillion dollars in national debt. Under Reagan, Bush won, and Clinton, 20 years, three presidents, it went from one to unfortunately five. 
trillion. Under George W. Bush alone, eight years, it went from five to ten. And then Obama showed up and said he was going to cut the deficit in half. Well, in three and a half years, the, the national debt has gone from ten trillion to over sixteen trillion dollars. And if his policies go into effect for the next even four and a half more years, and if that happens, they will really set the budget for the next six or eight years. His own Office of Management budget says that within about eight years, the national debt will be at $30 trillion. Now, when it was at $10 trillion when he came in, the average person entering the workforce in our country was going to have to spend about $172,000 during their career just to pay the interest on the national debt when it was $10 trillion. If it goes to 30 under his leadership, every person entering the workforce can look forward to paying over $515,000 during their career just to pay the interest on the national debt. Doesn't pay it off. $515,000 just to pay the interest off on the national debt. And we'll still have a national a debt at 30 trillion or more, uh, even if they kept it at that level. So we have some serious problems. You know, I don't think that the president, and it was evidence today, it, it, it's, we were sitting at the table here talking about what he used to say about gay marriage, and now it's changed. What he used to say about uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, we were going to force it, then we weren't. What we used to say about women, now there's a war on women that supposedly the Republicans run. Today, it's announced that we're just not going to enforce immigration laws on almost a million Americans who are not here legally. Now, granted, most of these are young people who were brought here by their parents, and we can't really fault them, per se, but I get the impression that the president's leadership style is what I might call leadership by band-aid. <laughs> Just running around trying to find whatever problem he can slap a band-aid on for a few months. Trying to appease a few people in November's election to try to get elected. He said when he got elected three and a half years ago that if he had not fixed the American economy within three years, he would be a one-term proposition. Yeah. I say it's time to... I don't think the president understands some very basics about our Constitution. And I hear that you had some uh, talks and, and seminars today about the Constitution. I like to, ex was Shane here today? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here tonight? Yeah. That believe. I explain that, I get asked to speak to a lot of youth groups. And I explain the Constitution with three electrical devices. <laughs> you know I'm a very visual person, right? The Kleenex boxes and all that. Uh, well, I explain the Constitution with three electrical devices. The first one is an extension cord. Now, an extension cord transfers power. Transfers power from the source to wherever you need it. I believe President Obama has it completely backwards in his head as to where the source of the power is. And I think that him and many in Washington, D.C. think that the source of the power comes from the government and it grants us our rights as a people. In fact, when the Bill of Rights was included in the Constitution, there was a pretty hefty debate about whether or not to do that. Because people were concerned that if we express the people's rights in the Constitution, people might get the idea that our rights were granted to us by the government. But you have to be very careful when you read the Bill of Rights. It doesn't grant us the right of free speech. It doesn't grant us the right to bear arms. The Second Amendment, for example, doesn't give the people the right to keep and bear arms. It says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The people had that right before the Constitution was written, before the government was born. Uh, all the First Amendment rights are expressed as the government cannot take these rights away. And so the first thing that the Constitution did was it transferred power from the people to the government. The first three words of the Constitution, of course, are we the people. 
Now, the second thing that the Constitution, now, oh, the other thing, you cannot delegate a power to something or someone if you don't have it in the first place. And if you carefully read the Constitution, there's only about 17 powers that are delegated to the, to the government, all in Article 1, Section 8. One of them is to, uh, let's just pick a couple here, to coin money, to provide a monetary system. Well, what power did the people have before the Constitution was written that would have allowed them to transfer the power to coin money and provide for a monetary system to the government? Well, of course, prior to money, they used to trade with each other. They would barter. Because the people had the right to economic freedom and exchange between willing traders, they had the right to transfer the power transfer some power to government to come up with a monetary system. So instead of having to barter directly, we could convert our goods and services into monetary form and exchange money instead of having to directly exchange goods and services. Because when I wanted bacon, I didn't want to have to wait for somebody to kill the pig in order to have bacon. So transfer of power was the first thing that the Constitution did. Second thing the Constitution did is represented by this device, which of course is a power strip. But it's a special power strip. It's got a little surge protector. A surge protector limits the amount of power that you can take out of this end to only the amount of power that's allowed to come in this end. If you try to take out too much here, it shuts down and says you can't have that much power. Or if the lightning strikes and you try to force too much power through here, it says no, no. We're limiting the amount of power only to the powers that were delegated to it by the people. So the second thing that the Constitution did, or tried to do, I don't think our president understands this one at all, <laughs> is to limit the power only to the powers given it by the people. The third thing that the Constitution does is represented by this device. It's got one male end, three female end, so you plug one in here and you can plug it. <laughs> That's how we talked it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Plug one in here, and you plug three in over here. Third thing the Constitution did was divide the power. The Founding Fathers didn't want to give all the power to one person or one entity, so they divided the power between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And so the three things that the Constitution did, and I don't think the President understands this one either, because a year ago he was saying that we couldn't possibly enact the DREAM Act or even a few portions of the DREAM Act, like happened today, by executive order, because that wasn't allowed under the Constitution. You couldn't just do by executive order what the, con what the Congress hadn't authorized. A year later, when it's five months ahead of the election, all of a sudden it's time to rewire the splitter and give one branch of government the power that another one really has. So those are the three things that the Constitution does. Transfers power from the people to the government, limits the power to only the powers that were given it by the people, and then divides the power. But for being a constitutional professor, somehow the uh, president has missed much of what the Constitution really does. Now, I've done about 35 or 40 songs, but today, within the last six or eight months, as many of you know, I finally decided we needed a Republican song. And so uh, this is to the tune of uh, John Denver's Thank God I'm a Country Boy, but it's Thank God I'm Republican. And I'll do it a little slower so that you can hear it. Well, life in Arizona is kind of laid back. Ain't much an old Prescott boy like me can't pack. All we gotta do is take Washington back. Thank God I'm Republican. Well, living in our means never did us no harm, but the president thinks money grows on a farm. His policies suck and he's running out of charm. We need a Republican. The House and the Senate while the Democrats cry and complain every minute. On November 6th, Mitt Romney's gonna win it. Coming to our country.
country, use the front door, please. That's how we're American. <laughs> the redistricting commission is meeting out of order. The Arizona Republic is down to three reporters. <laughs> I don't know why that gets such a good laugh. <laughs> hey, Napolitano, would you please secure the border? We need a Republican. Here we got us a governor, the House and the Senate, while the Democrats cry and complain every minute. On November 6th, the wrong is yellow women. We need a Republican. <laughs> third person, third person. Well, Obama gives a speech, so we'll think he really cares. The economy so bad it has given him gray hair. The first thing we should do is repeal Obamacare. <laughs> we don't need higher taxes. The spending is too high. He's asking for more money, but he can't tell us why. His lips are still moving, so here comes another lie. <laughs> <laughs>